welcome to the Sandy. Thank you all for coming and being so punctual. Um, for those of you for whom this is not the first uh, Gordon Chung talk at Del Santi, uh, welcome back. And for those of you for whom it is the first, you're in for a treat. Um, we have staged four shows with Gordon um, in an almost 10 year long relationship. Um, and I have confidence when I say that this is the most ambitious of those four. Um, since we've worked with Gordon, he's, well actually long since we've worked with Gordon, he's an artist who's been described in these sort of dualities. Um, the terms dystopia and utopia are often thrown at him at the same time. Um, he has often tried to sort of make work that's about the spaces that spaces that are really new and that are emerging uh, from when he was at art school to trying to capture the information age to the present day and this exhibition where he's examined very closely um, new geographies in China and the greater China area that have really emerged uh, in the last decade, some of them, and that's the landscapes that you're surrounded by. Um, who better to take you through these challenging landscapes than uh, Mark Rappel? Um, for those of you that don't know Mark, uh, Mark is the editor-in-chief of Art Review, and he's also uh, probably the best traveled um, art writer, curator that I know, especially in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, in fact, in 2013, Mark launched uh, Art Review Asia, which is one of the first originally Western art publications to focus specifically on targeting an Asian audience. Uh, so hopefully this is a great meeting of the minds and uh, without further ado, I give you Mark and Thank you. Um, so I thought like after all the nice talk about utopia and dystopia, yeah. maybe we should start with how these paintings are curated and talk about perversion to some degree. Because there's a perverse way that you take data, the newspaper, data of markets and stocks, and then you overlay it with a kind of, which is the ground for the paintings, and then you overlay it with a kind of quasi-romantic, idealized landscape imagery, mm -hmm. and then also superimposed data mapping the structural networks in greater China yes. over the top again. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how those two things, the sort of slightly romantic, maybe sci-fi portrayal, and the sort of data analysis to some degree, fit together. It's a response, I suppose, to the way how the narratives that we build in respect to how we uh, perceive the world is through mythologies and uh, stories, sort of fictional realities. And um, these kind of stories bind us or help unite us in order to be able to then pursue bigger projects. And so the biggest project is civilizations. Yeah. Um, so using originally from 1995, I suppose, I started using the stock listings of the Financial Times in reference to this information space that we found ourselves in. So it was the communications and digital revolution. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that this was our new landscape uh, that uh, I wanted to capture <coughs> while at art school because I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, find, yeah, I found it incredibly profound and compelling to try and uh, find a way to visualize it. Yeah. And I guess in these works which tackle Greater China or Hong Kong and China, depending mm -hmm. where you sit, yeah. um, there's also a relationship to Hong Kong that's colonial. Yes. That is very much about numbers yeah. and profits. And it has a particular resonance in these works. Yeah, so the, even back in the 90s, it was the dominant, the dominant economic model of what is capitalism. And so around 1997 was the handover, and I immediately made a piece of work. I remember I was in the living room of my student flat, and I grabbed hold of these large sheet cans and uh, started shredding them because they had these kind of Arcadian landscapes of China mm -hmm. with this sort of beautiful image of a factory pumping out smoke. And I like that sort of disparity between 
uh, uh, those two sort of um, uh, what should be sort of contradictory sort of imagery. And, um, and Hong Kong, of course, was something back then I didn't really understand, even, to, uh, even though my parents are from there, yeah. as being a colony. And, and so all this imagery of the handover and the importance that was given to it, going back to China, uh, it took probably you know, another 15 more years before I started to realize some of the histories, if you like, behind that. And that's what I've started sort of looking at more in depth with this recent body of work. So you were talking earlier about how um, stories are what unites us. Mm. And obviously in these paintings, as a representative of the Chinese government, I might say that it's infrastructure mm -hmm. and railway systems yes. and communication systems that mm. unites us. Mm. So maybe you could describe the systems that you've uh, mapped out in these paintings. Sure. And then we can debate about which thing unites us. Uh, so the, the, the show sort of begins with these two paintings that are probably the widest perspective uh, in respect to uh, the Towers of Water, which is the Tibetan Plateau and the river, the river systems, the main river systems that uh, China is beginning to dam up. And those that rely on uh, the rivers downstream, China will have uh, political leverage uh, over. Uh, it's also for, to supply obviously the hydroelectric sort of demands. And, uh, and in each of the paintings actually there's a sacred mountain. Yeah. And so the sacred, these sacred mountains, uh, a set of five, was traditionally what the emperor would visit in order to sanctify his divine rights to rule over his subjects. And so the other painting on the other side, String of Pearls, is actually a term that's devised by a US military contractor to uh, define, if you like, a narrative to suggest that China's uh, infrastructural investment in these ports uh, along the Maritime Silk Road is one of uh, offence and defence and for trade and energy uh, yeah. purposes. Um, but they, obviously China denies that and says that um, it's to do with uh, connecting trade routes and to maintain uh, good relations or strengthen relations between the nations in which they're investing in. And then as we move up uh, further, uh, you get more specifically closer to China's yeah. uh, infrastructure sort of uh, uh, projects. So for example, the, the title painting of the show, Tears of Paradise, is of the Pearl River Economic uh, Zone. And it's about nine uh, districts that are connected by high-speed rail, 22 million people, and worth about 20% GDP of uh, China's uh, uh, economy. Uh, and then at the top is the One Belt, One Road, which is uh, a map of the, the nations that are being connected by trade agreements uh, by China. So it's the largest human project. Yeah. And it also involves infrastructure developments. Yeah, and infrastructure investments. Curious yeah. extensions of Chinese legal dominions. Chinese well, legal. in the sense that a lot of the laws that govern these developments yeah. are Chinese law even if they happen to be in the Pacific Islands or Right, Africa. right, right. And yeah, they also bring in their own workforce yeah. and so on into those projects. And, and, uh, and often working with nations that uh, the West won't uh, work with in that, uh, to the extent that China's investing into those nations yeah. uh, as well, because they don't, for perhaps geopolitical reasons, uh, in order you know, to keep them in a certain status or condition, they'd rather have them uh, in, a, in a weakened position as opposed to one in which uh, there is significant infrastructure uh, being built and for their economies to also thrive. Now it's uh, depending on each uh, nation that they've invested in and depending on the political systems that they have in place and the, the leaderships and the amount of corruption uh, mm -hmm. in those uh, places um, is being uh, a, uh, it, there have been uh, successes and, uh, and uh, failures. Yeah. And do you think these structures are shifting the global geopolitics as much as the local ones? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's 
what's being talked about for for a number of decades yeah. now, you know, about the, this uh, rise or return of uh, China and um, the, the the way that they seem to be enacting policies that are more about strengthening trade between or mutual trade between between nations. Now, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons, you know, uh, in some ways for that, because they were the manufacturing hub of the world, and now that uh, the middle classes are growing, and now there's a shift towards creating an internal economy, the resources that they need can no longer be solely found within uh, China yeah. itself. So they have to, in a way, sort of like extend beyond. So they're doing grain in Africa and things like that. Yes, and uh, things like um, uh, rare earths and, uh, and so on. But rather than going in and attacking with war and invading and conquering and stealing and so on, they decided that this has right. to be the yeah, to actually work with other nations. So it's possible yeah. that because if they did that, they wouldn't be able to fight you know, against the repercussions of that. Yeah, which is in some ways very similar to, say, the East India Company. Back right. in the day, the glory days. The, the, the East India Trade Company, which is uh, actually featured in one of the paintings over there, yeah. uh, the string of pearls. So the, the, the boat in the bottom left corner um, is actually the, the gunboat Nemesis yeah. that was the first to go to um, uh, China. Yeah. And uh, so, so what happened was that during the European, what was to be called the Opium Wars, was that uh, Britain was uh, selling, um, uh, or East India Trade Company was uh, smuggling opium into China uh, in exchange for silver for that they made. Because the emperor had forbidden. Yeah, the emperor had uh, forbidden and uh, wrote a letter to Queen Victoria and she ignored it. And so they burnt a whole load of um, opium crates and uh, in response, the merchants got very angry, went back to uh, England and said, uh, you need to do something about this. They debated the morality of defending uh, drug smuggling yeah. and decided to go to war. And uh, as a result, uh, Hong Kong was uh, given to uh, the British Empire. Yeah. I think it's interesting in, in a lot of the works that you've pictured these infrastructure systems as kind of constellations? Yeah, some of them are as uh, constellations, so they... they sort of mythologize them a little bit. Yeah, they kind of, um, like as if they're written in the stars, as if there's a sort of destiny, if you like. Uh, it's this kind of convergence of like real structures, but then, you know, these real structures are also surrounded by mythologies. Yeah. You know, they, you, in order to be able to sell these, if you like, these sorts of projects to the people to get them to build them, you know, it has to be for a, a greater good, if you like, you know, and that's often wrapped up in uh, ideas of uh, becoming uh, greater. Yeah. And you think that's one of the reasons you put them together with the sacred mountain? Yeah, I was layering sort of different um, uh, fictional realities, if you like, so, in general, although not in all of the paintings, there's a human scale at the bottom, yeah. and then a harnessing of the landscape, and then a sort of divine uh, order or a fictional reality, and then a, and then a future, a future space. And by human scale, you kind of mean the architecture that you did. Yeah. So the buildings or the animals at the bottom, yeah. you know, the the. The, the, the symbol of the home, yeah. the unit of the civilization. But these aren't just any old buildings. Uh, no, they're not. They're the uh, so, for example, in Desert of the Real, uh, over on the right here, the building there is a torn down building in Kashgar uh, that China has um, demolished um, because the. Area that I'm depicting in that painting is of northwest China, Xinjiang Province, where the Uyghur Muslims are being um, re-educated. Re uh, and uh, uh, what, whereas the West would call it concentration camps, um, 
or boarding schools mm -hmm. according to China and de extremification de centers. Yeah. And um, so it's a particularly sensitive area. Uh, so beyond the human rights issue and the way how uh, a civilization or leadership deals with certain minorities, uh, the geopolitical situation in northwest of China is that it's going to be the busiest intersection of the Belt and Road project. It borders eight nations. Uh, one of those nations has invaded uh, China in the past, uh, Russia. Yeah. And, um, and Russia, or the USSR at the time, in 1949, supported the separatist movement of the Uyghur Muslims in that region. Uh, they then abandoned them uh, for favorable terms with China. Yeah. And then China repressed uh, the Uyghur Muslims. And over the decades, of course, uh, resentment and also through internal colonization by the high-speed rail, yeah. uh, which is what's in the sky, it, uh, the, the dominant demographics of that region has almost become 42% uh, Uyghur and about 40% uh, Han Chinese, yeah. whereas before it was 80 something percent. Which is something that's happening throughout China. Well, it's happening around um, places like Tibet yeah. uh, as well. So, and again, uh, if we talk beyond the human rights issues, uh, geopolitically, uh, Tibet represents the water towers of Asia. Yeah. So if, and since Tibet is without an army, if a foreign power does take control of that region, uh, they control the water towers yeah. and therefore the rivers of China and enormous political leverage over their sovereignty. Yeah. But it's interesting you come, coming back to sort of statistics and facts mm. and realities when, like I said before, the kind of mythologizing and yes. the kind of maybe like undatifiable characters, characteristics in the work with the sort of landscapes and sort of constellations um, somehow also takes stuff away from these realities too. Mm. And it's maybe that classic science fiction trope where you want to write about something that's plausible, yeah. Um, so therefore, quite close to the present, mm. but at the same time, slightly unimaginable. Mm. Um, and that's what the fiction thing is. Yeah. Is that something you also try and do in your work? Yeah, I suppose there is this sort of science fiction uh, aspect uh, to the work, and that is partly because I love science yeah. fiction. Like so I guess I meant kind of structurally rather than literally. Uh, in structurally, in the sense of like trying to fix this point that's tied to a kind of reality, mm. but kind of abstracted from it at the same time. Yeah, it's kind of enwrapping or tying or weaving facts and histories into uh, a digestible kind of story. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it, it, it's a, such an important way of experiencing you know, our uh, humanity, you know, through, yeah. through stories. And stories are, uh, or, or narratives or mythologies and so on, incredibly important aspect, like, like I said before, which is a way of uniting people under a, under a cause, if you like, uh, in order to be able to build towards these uh, larger uh, projects, these real things. Yeah. I think it also speaks a little bit to, so for instance, after Chapman Square, a lot mm. of the kind of early fiction about it from the side of the students yeah. would go into like, you know, stories of the mountains and feasts um, and abstract from the reality to be able to tell the story because it was straight to prison. Yeah, um, yeah. but even like, even if we talk about classic Chinese painting, yeah. for example, the, the ink uh, paintings that, you know, which will come to mind to anybody that thinks of what the Chinese painting is. Yeah. Um, the mountains represented the state and so the culture of those painters at the time, the, the educated elite, uh, they were often people that would work for the, the, the emperor. Yes. Uh, they would be waiting potentially for a position. And so they would use ink painting as a way of recording or codifying their relationship to the state. Yeah. And so through the poetry that's embedded inside, within the paintings themselves, and also everything else that was written about them, they were able to convey uh, their relationship, how
how they felt about that particular dynasty that was in control. So in some ways, I'm always saying that uh, all art, in some ways, it has a political uh, aspect to it, whether it's apathy or you know, overtly you know, suggesting or creating a forum to sort of uh, think about some of those wider important issues. So when you show this kind of multiply coded language here, to so the mountains that people may or may not recognise, mm -hmm. the constellations that people probably may not recognise now but might impact on the map sometime yeah. in the future. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of sign of optimism that or do people have to get all these codes in the work? Well, they can appreciate it on, on just this aesthetic. Is that wrong? Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. Uh, not at all. Um, uh, I'd be very happy if uh, people enjoyed my paintings just on that level. Yeah. But I would hope, a bit like getting to know someone, that as you get deeper and deeper into like how they're actually thinking, what they're thinking about, what they really believe, um, that it will be a, a further enriching sort of experience. Um, I don't expect people to get everything in, in the yeah. of course. Because um, I think we were when we were talking, the last time we met, maybe we were talking a little bit how the works are kind of hyperlinked, in a way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. interface. Yeah. yeah, and then you go up here. What's that? And that's yeah. another story. And I think that's one of maybe one of the reasons for me that they work as paintings rather than digital mm. images or moving images, which might have been an alternative way of doing it. Yeah. Um, how do you know when too many when you've got too many of these things? There is that <laughs> saturation. <laughs> um, you uh, when I don't do anything else to it. Basically, I mean, it, quite often, you know, a painting will be sitting in a studio, and, and I don't know that it's finished. Yeah. You know, until until I realise it is, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe even like years down the line, I might want to do more stuff to it or something. You know, so yeah. it, it's a never it, in a way don't really uh, uh, know. It depends on your mindset and where you think something is uh, finished or a deadline. So, do you ever come across a problem where um, you get an old work back? from a collector's say, for a show, and you decide you might want to do a little bit more to it? I once changed something on a painting, uh, um, with permission from the collector, um, but that's just very, very rare, you know, very rare. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you also, like, in the way you construct the images with the newspaper, have this kind of slightly pixelated... Yeah. Aspect to them. So that's all back to uh, this notion of an information space that we all exist in, mm -hmm. this world in which capital is moving in instantaneously, trillions mm -hmm. in an instant, and wherever it accumulates creates uh, dystopias and utopias. Yeah. Um, so the pixel is the unit, if you like, of that of that space, is the atom of that of that datascape. Yeah. And something that we're extremely familiar with when we see low resolution JPEG images uh, and so on. So for me, it's this, um, it is this artificial information space, um, and the pixel represents that. But also, I guess the screen is the main way through which we see representations of these infrastructure networks. It's sort of the only way to kind of comprehend them. Yeah, I mean, it's like we're so, so much of our time now is engaged through the screen. And not only that, but the fact that we're, we're, we're in some ways teleporting through these electronic spaces. You know, when we click on a link, it you know, sends a signal up somewhere and fires it down into a server in the desert, words the machine, sends it back to you. And in some ways, you, you're constantly teleporting through those, uh, through those spaces. Yeah. And um, so, for me, this is our modernity. <laughs> I don't think it's the president. You know? I don't actually think it's the president. No. No. I just think it's a new way of um, uh, of being. It's, a, it's not. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't diminish our humanity. Yeah. You know? It just creates another instrument for us to traverse. But I guess in these works, there's not many really humans. There isn't. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> so what's the problem with humans? Uh, I guess I yeah. wanted to create uh, a existential sort of space yeah and so when you remove the human you yourself is the one that remains as you're looking into these uh, spaces and so when you're at the brink of something uh, epic and uh, uh, sublime 
Yeah. Uh, the questions of what does it mean to be, who am I, what am I, why am I, are, are you know, these universal questions of what does it mean to exist. Yeah. And, and in some ways that's, that's the question that I'm always asking in respect to, you know, despite the grandeur of these projects, despite the enormity that these are the largest human projects in history, what does it ultimately mean? Yeah. You know, it's one of the questions that I'm most, I guess, interested in. Have you answered it? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Some more words to come. No, yeah. but it does remind me of like, um, there was a top 10 regrets that people at their deathbeds, you know, had. And, and it's not, you know, ever, um, they never sort of say that, uh, I wish I made more money. I wish I wish I got more <laughs> more stuff. You yeah. know, um, it's usually that you know they wish they spent more time in the art. You know. So we've sort of been ignoring the amazing stage set we created for this talk. Yeah. Um, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about the works that are behind us. So uh, as the paintings shift from a wider perspective towards more sort of internal China projects, we reach this installation of traditional Chinese windows that for me represents homes. Mm -hmm. And so windows, of course, need walls. And here they're invisible, so there's a kind of implied ghost architecture of homes phasing in and out. And they were kind of in response to the uh, rapid urbanization of uh, China. Yeah. And so many of these sorts of older buildings with these types of windows would be torn down. Mm -hmm. And so the windows started to conceptually, for me, represent the demarcation between communism to capitalist communism. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, there's a lot of romantic sort of uh, narratives around uh, uh, a window, you know, wistfully looking out and uh, an interior to an exterior. Um, so it had all these kind of uh, resonances that I was interested in. But, Originally, all of the window designs, they came from a book that I found in a thrift shop in, in Chinatown uh, about 15 years ago. And at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Yeah. And then about three, four years ago, I realised that I wanted to make these. Yeah. I remember talking to you about, so I was in Shanghai last year mm. um, with an artist who wanted to make a kind of traditional cheesy traditional yeah. performance based on Chinese opera in a warehouse space. And we went to all these shops now in Shanghai yeah. that sell fake versions oh, yeah, yeah. of antique yeah. Yeah. windows if you want yeah. to kind of... You know, Great, I might get some. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that somehow that legacy is also present in China. It's not that sort of symbolism, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I mean, some of these can look like as though they come from Islamic tradition, yes. or even Greek in some uh, So uh, the designs, the scholars are, uh, are very few uh, in, about Chinese traditional windows. Mm. Um, but I think it's uh, probably to do with the Silk Roads yeah. and the transmission of culture through the Silk Roads, which was basically globalization at the pace of the camel. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting reflection in respect to the paintings too, that they're the fusion of different cultural references. Mm. Yeah. So this one, for instance, might be simultaneously an 18th century classical landscape. Yeah, yeah. As much as it might also be a kind of traditional Chinese mm. classical landscape. Yeah, so I was interested, I've always been interested in the tradition of the sublime landscape yeah. painting. So, and... They would have people in that. They would have had people with them, yeah. They would have a tiny little figure in them that yeah. would represent something How small, very yeah. different, yeah. So, well, also politically or, or, yeah. or propaganda-wise, they would represent their conqueror. Yes. You know, so often those territories are these kind of magnificent virgin worlds, you know, these kind of promised lands in which the tiny figure has discovered. And so erased from that narrative of the landscape is those that would have existed and had always been there. Yeah. And I guess there's also this history of landscape painting being about property and ownership, whether it's physical yeah. property or intellectual property. Yeah. And I guess that's something that chimes in with the kind of infrastructure 
in these things. Yeah, I guess in particular that piece as well, because it, there's an internal colonization going on as well. We're only talking about that piece because that's the one I can see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could talk about that yeah. piece, too, so, um, the, which is the, the merging of three, three cities into a megalopolis of 130 million people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but back to the sublime paintings, you know, I was always fascinated by uh, the romantic language of it. So it would be of overwhelming nature to the individual into a, into a kind of terror. And that experience was what brought you close to the experience of God. Yeah. And so God was in the force of nature or the beauty and awe and the, the sheer overwhelming scale compared to your mind, you um, a person within the landscape that's almost swallowed up. Yeah. Um, but of course, uh, it's also the fact that it was seen as a way of suggesting that all this land has been given to you because you're a believer. Yeah. And I guess at the same time, does that mean that in these paintings, the infrastructure <coughs> networks are the gods? Um, I mean, maybe, I mean, I, I did used to think about the stock market in that way, yeah. as a new, as a new god. Did you invest in that? I failed to invest. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm artist. That's why I'm artist, yeah. Um, but it was this notion that we're surrounded by all these numbers, what is omniscient, omnipotent, is these numbers. Um, that affect all of us and no more sensationally and spectacularly um, uh, evidenced by the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah. You know, there was a two week period where we didn't know whether the system itself was going to completely collapse and that we were going to go into an apocalypse of sorts. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was this uh, crazy time when it was like the end of capitalism was front page news. And, um, and of course things have carried on. Um, but yeah, this idea that these numbers are constantly surrounding us, perhaps in the same way as how divine uh, narratives are constructed. Yeah. Um, but I guess in the same way that numbers construct the geometries on these window frames. Right, right. You mean that? So one way of seeing them is just as a mathematical pattern. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's particularly put them next to this. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the numbers have always, uh, the, the numbers of the stock listings have always been important because it's a dominant, like I said, it's a dominant economic model uh, on a global scale. Yeah. But when I was a student, there was always talk about globalization, global villages, super information, super highways, and so on. And that's where the geographic. <coughs> sort of euphoria came from before we had all the multiple global crashes and so on. And yet you use that data from a newspaper, which no serious trader would do. No, they don't use it anymore, it's true, yeah. And I guess it's this interesting part that maybe not when you first started doing, but now seems part of tradition. Yeah. As well, much as 18th century landscape painting might be. Right. So it's a... Uh, it was, a, at the time, a convenient material to use. I was literally using it like a pigment yeah. uh, of the paintings themselves. So I would shrink <coughs> them and pulp them and uh, try to make my own uh, version of the paint. Yeah. But that paint was actually information of the very space that I was trying to depict in the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, no uh, trader uses them now. It's used to this information, it's redundant. Yeah. So, in fact, it's used for advertising space. Yeah. That's the primary vehicle for these sorts of pages nowadays. Yeah. Um, but I still think it has this kind of, uh, obviously, relationship to that space. It symbolizes that space. Yeah. And that's the reason why I still continue to use uh, this material. Yeah. And you talked about the things you do in newspaper, and also in the works you do a lot with sand. Mm. And now you finally freed yourself to do sculpture. Yes. Is that something you've always wanted to do? I've actually made sculpture, maybe one sculpture per year, yeah. uh, for a while. And um, because this is, 
Hã? Quer dizer, Vasco. Quer dizer, Vasco. Quer dizer, Vasco. But this is the first, maybe, uh, branch of work, if you like, that is, for sure, a permanent aspect of uh, how I'll continue to make, to make uh, work. And does it feel different like the same? There are similar structures uh, to the way how I make art and the way, I guess, and so the manifestation, if you like, of what comes from that structure is the difference. But really, the core concerns and the way that I think about constructing things um, is similar. You just, you just exchange different materials. So the layering, for example, is a, of course a primary way of constructing anything, whether that's materially, but first of all, it's the concepts that you tie together into an interrelated, uh, and I usually draw out the mind map, right. and then I'm able to piece out um, uh, certain conglomerates of interconnected ideas, and then find the visual forms for each of those, and layer them together. Yeah. So it's a similar mentality. So the ideas and the concepts come first, and then the kind of material representation comes second? Uh, yes. Uh, sometimes you produce an unknown space within the composition in order to force yourself to create a new language. Yeah. <clears throat> so that then that is the seedbed for a future uh, painting or work or maybe even an entire branch of work such as these sculptures. Yeah. And what was the seedbed for these paintings? My interest in looking at the history of China, you know, it became that much more important to me over the years to finally figure out why everybody keeps talking about it for a start, and also, of course, uh, for personal reasons, to find out my own, my own ancestry, uh, living here in the UK, born here in the UK, not understanding what the handover meant in 1997, and what it means to be uh, a colonial subject uh, that was born in a, you know, a different country mm. to one that... You're a colonizer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a colonizer. Is that what you said? That's what your passport says. Oh, yes. Yeah. In that case, yeah, I'm a complicit colonizer yeah, in, uh, in, uh, in that regard. Um, and yeah, just understanding those sorts of contradictions, yeah. actually, and coming to terms with with that as well. But these are men, I mean, quite resolutely about the present in these works. Um, and history maybe comes in with the opium, yeah. and the mountains, and tradition, but not, say, in terms of similar systems in China, like telegraphs, telegraph yeah. wires, um, mm. railways, yeah. um, the old-fashioned type, yeah. um, which were used for similar purposes yeah. as China was sort of inventing itself, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So things like uh, Manifest Destiny was that uh, iconic poster of an angel laying down telegraph lines while the pioneers are chasing away the Native American Indians because uh, it was their right. Yeah. So they were blocking were, progress. And then what? They were blocking progress. And then they were, yeah, they were, they were blocking progress, yeah, because they didn't understand what it means to be civilized. Yes. Uh, yes. Is the narrative. Um, so. Um, but yeah, no, there's all sorts of there's the you know the romantic language of mythologies you know infused through the work as well. These experiences that are important, I think, to the human condition. Yeah. Um, so before we open up for questions from the audience, maybe we can finally come to the title of the show. Oh yeah, yeah. the tears of paradise. paradise. Um, do you see that as a kind of negative or positive thing? It seems mixed, right? It is, yeah, because tears could be also tears. Yeah. So, uh, and then the tears could be of joy or yes. of sadness. Uh, in a way, I'm being ambiguous, yeah. of course, about it because I'm opening it up to um, discussion to think about. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you uh, frame a work of art within a political uh, forum, if you like, it becomes a very divisive issue. Everybody has very strong opinions about yeah. what something means in, in that context. And 
so, you know, to lay down, if you like, facts and then, you know, then leave it open to uh, discussion. And, and to the point, as we said earlier, where maybe people don't get what the facts are. No, I mean, you know, I don't think in England or Britain they know that much about opium wars yeah. or what, what the empire actually really did, you know, um, to, to the world that they colonised, yes. you know, at what cost. Um, it made Britain great. It did, and uh, it had fabulous buildings as a result of uh, you know slavery, militarised trade routes, yeah. and so on uh, for over hundreds and hundreds of years, and uh, leaving a legacy that many are still uh, recovering from. Yeah. So, you know, these are extraordinary stories um, and incredible systems of organization in order to achieve yeah. that at a human cost. And so Tears of Paradise is, is an ambiguous term, you know, it's like, well, whose paradise is it? Yeah. And, you know, who, you know, and whose was it before? Yeah. Um, and who is crying over it, over joy or sadness, and who's tearing it up? Yeah. Is some of the you know, long-rooted historical questions that I'm, you know, interested in not only learning about, but, uh, yeah, figuring out and perhaps questioning and asking any of us whether this is what we want our humanity to actually represent. Yeah, and I think these dynamics also implicate third parties as well. So the titles remind me, I was in a talk between a bunch of Indian artists and theorists Chinese artists and theorists about the similarities the current urban conditions have and the kind of art that develops in terms of rapid urbanization. Mm. And it's all about, you know, what they've got in common until one moment when one of the Chinese speakers turns around and goes, first you gave us Buddhism, then you gave us opium, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe that's a good place to ask questions. <laughs> So questions from board. There's one at the back. kind of uh, touched on some of the many reasons as to why I, I depict light in the way that I do in the paintings. They're, they're kind of like uh, threshold spaces. Uh, and also, they're like the golden hour, if you like. Uh, they only last for a certain period of time. And um, so they could be seen as a, a, a natural uh, dawn or dusk light, uh, maybe a nuclear glow. Uh, so there's this kind of um, ambiguous, again ambiguous sort of um, depiction of uh, what type of space uh, these lights are trying to generate. And, um, but also in reference to the, the neon landscapes through which we all exist, these artificial worlds that we've constructed on this uh, more epic scale. Yeah. And uh, so it's kind of um, uh, building a always a space in order to question the embedded narratives and symbols that are in the, in the paintings. Okay. Other questions? Is there a reason for animal forms to appear? You don't, hmm? you don't allow human yeah. forms to appear in the landscape, but you do allow animals to appear in the environment. Yeah, I do, yeah. So the, the animals are a uh, symbol of nature. But many of them have uh, mythological symbolism as well. So, for example, a deer, uh, messenger of gods, and um, it's um, a way again of uh, depicting the, the different types of mythologies that we use or that are part of us as a uh, as a culture, as a person, as an individual, as a tribe, as a nation. So they're. Um, yeah, depends on uh, each. Each of those sorts of symbols depends on 
the nation as well. It's kind of, you know, so Buddhism is prosperity. But also has a resonance in Chinese literature, the term the mountains and the seas, for instance. The mountains and the seas. Yeah. Mm. Which is very particularly this kind of description of um, weird animals that the narrator meets as he travels through the country, which often have kind of supernatural powers. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably related to like animism yeah. uh, or animistic sort of beliefs in which a time in which uh, our connection to nature was that much more perhaps deeper in respect to seeing that uh, gods and creatures and uh, spirits were actually in the landscape itself, uh, whereas uh, monotheistic sort of uh, uh, religions they tend to detach that um, relationship between. Uh, uh, an inherent respect for landscape. It's more like that the land is for me to control because it's for me, it's been given to me. Whereas in animism or animistic type of beliefs, um, you have to, because if you, if you anger the soil gods, for example, then you're not going to get a harvest next year. I was curious, could you take us through kind of the, like, Sort of practice process or the just trial and error that you went through to even from when you were kind of young to get to this sort of stage now? What is your sort of repetitive practice process, I guess? To and you, you want to hear about the process I guess, from when uh, I, I was a student or? I guess either from when you were a student or how you, you know, the thought that goes into making one of these, for example, do you have studies that you work on? This oh, kind of thing? yeah, yeah. Uh, so over the years, it has become much more complex in, in respect to how I make uh, art. So when I was a student, I started as an abstract artist. So it's very much um, reducing everything, but uh, maximizing maybe the meaning uh, into, into these um, uh, minimal uh, strategies. So for example, uh, shredding, uh, uh, stop listings of the Financial Times into an all over uh, abstract work. Uh, for me, the, a kind of reflection of the data scape in which we live in. Uh, and then over the years, I started, uh, I started constructing more uh, languages and more ways of depicting uh, the, the interest that I would have, which would shift from, uh, say for example, uh, just information landscapes on a global scale, utopias, dystopias, to things like trophy hunters uh, as an extreme form of a consumer uh, through to today's sort of geopolitics of uh, modern histories uh, through uh, in reflection to uh, histories written by Victors. Uh, so for example, The Tears of Paradise is, is about uh, the Opium Wars and the whole show is kind of in some ways framed by the century of humiliation when China was attacked. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of suggesting that many of these grand projects that they're undergoing is in response to that never happening again. Just wondering how, how do you think these works might translate into print work, or do they? Um, but, yeah, I make, I make prints, but I, I know you make prints, yeah. but I mean, because of the layering involved, and I'm just interested. Well, again, just uh, all you do is just change the uh, technique with the multi-layered way in which I construct uh, an image. So it begins on the computer, you know, and so I can, I can, and on the computer in Photoshop, it's built by layers. So you can, you can go through multiple and very fast different images the compositions before you arrive at one image you feel you can commit to. And then once you commit to that image, then you can, and during the time that you're constructing it, you're thinking about the different materials for each of those layers and how that might manifest in, uh, in physical uh, uh, reality. And that includes colours as well, so you can keep changing the colours until it's right uh, before you commit to um, but then, and then it becomes a slight, it becomes a different thing because the color is never the same as on, on screen. So, and then you, you, you shift in and out until you don't feel you can do it anymore. So, prints is the same. Prints, you know, so I, 
just interchange uh, each technique with a, with a print technique. There's a question in the middle. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, a detailed question, really. Um, China seems to have gone from, uh, speaking of someone with very little knowledge in China, but it's gone from being a country that, or a civilization that changed barely at all in a thousand years to one that's changed phenomenally in a hundred years. So yeah. it's gone from one extreme to another. Yeah. So, so sort of putting your science fiction hat on, where do you see it going next? <laughs> Uh, is it going to be another extreme, or is this just going? What What do you? Oh, you think that it was? A, it, it, they went for an well, they went for an extreme change because they were invaded. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. you know, and then they had to sort of um, yeah. throw out the ruling elite and um, yeah, but the way they changed, re-establish change as a consequence of that has been phenomenal. The change has been fast. Yeah. Anywhere else in the world, really. Because, yeah. Um, just uh, where you see no, I don't know. I'll be I'll be waiting to see what will happen yeah. as well. But so far, it seems, you know, if you look at like the projects that are happening, um, they're pretty crazy. It's just like more railway built than the entire world history, more roads built than the entire world history. You know, it's just the the projects are totally crazy. Eight hundred million people lifted from poverty. You know, these cities, like even with the coronavirus situation, three hospitals built in 10 days, you know, it's kind of, um, I don't know where that will uh, lead. But it's interesting that uh, some writers wrote about it as if it was a terrifying uh, situation, yeah. you know, and, um, and that I find interesting as well, this kind of uh, narrative of uh, good versus evil, or democracy versus communism. And... Um, so I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what's what's going to happen, but um, um, it's something that I'll probably be making paintings about as I uh, as I continue to witness it. But it's interesting this history of colonization of China isn't really taught in Chinese schools. The the center of humiliation, I think, is part of, but the, not as colonization. So it's attacks and battles. Yeah. yeah, right. Is that what they, how they depict yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Um, they don't talk about it as a semi <coughs> um, no. So they don't talk they about it. They skirt around Japan like that. They don't. So how they, they, how do, they talk about it as an occupation? Yeah. yeah. But not colonization. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a... Yeah, unpleasant fact. <laughs> there was a question at the back that went up last time. What's my thing with mists? Um, it, it kind of dematerializes uh, the, the physicality, if you, if you like, of, uh, of the image. Um, formally or technically it allows me to blend uh, spaces uh, together. But it could also be read as a, uh, a dust cloud, uh, a, a sort of uh, the glow of a light pollution. Um, it could also be a, a natural mist, so um, it's a way of converging all those different sort of spaces between the natural and the artificial. So there's a question in the middle. As a leader. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, the 12th century painting readers would often describe their the act of looking painting as traveling while lying down, oil. And so you could envision and walk through the landscape while literally relaxing and at leisure. Um, I'm wondering that in your um, um, conceptualization of the five sacred mountains Obviously, there are many, but so you chose a perspective version. 
I chose the one that traditionally the emperor would visit. Um, but yeah, there are multiple sets of sacred mountains in China. But that was the one that... So you've got no need to actually... I mean, you don't need to, obviously, but... This, no. is, this is part of the... <laughs> I couldn't possibly like, have visited the entirety of China as well. Like, yeah. this is like, but yeah, maybe one day I will. Uh, or over 70 nations of the one that one road. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> maybe not. This is part of the, the maybe not after this show. <laughs> so this is part of the fictional history slash mythology of the place, right? The actual, these are places that are sacred that most people actually don't visit and take from, or as given as sacred. What do you mean? Uh, oh, well, there, there are the five sacred mountains, yeah. and we know where they are, yeah. and the, the very, very few people actually make these pilgrimages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But culturally, you know, as symbols, they, right, yeah. they resonate, right? So, of course, they're not sacred to everyone. Um, but they are to um, uh, to the culture of uh, China. So um, that that was the aspect that I was interested in uh, the way how we develop certain mythologies uh, or sacred ideas um, in order to bind us uh, into a uh, unified identity. Can we take one last question in the corner? If one looks at how China plans, it's on a completely different basis than the rest of the world. I mean, the rest of the world is very short term um, in terms of its politics, its economics, and uh, especially in terms of military, there's a belief that actually China is planning on a 50 year basis. And, uh, and then you say, when someone has asked, you know, this is a comment on the present, and you're, you're, you're trying not to be critical, or you're, it's like a photograph of what is now. And when the question was asked, what do you see the future as being? I see all of these as very futuristic. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to tell us what the future message is. In, in your art, because, I, because there is a long term plan going on. Yes. I, I really don't know. I mean, it's just, um, I, I can't, um, I mean, a lot of the. I inject the question, the existential questions of what does it mean uh, throughout all of the paintings, uh, precisely perhaps for that uh, reason. Um, yeah, these are. Uh, enormously grand projects, but I, I wouldn't know where to start in respect to speculating about where this will all lead. Is this the future of the world for you? Uh, it's an aspect of the future of the world, yeah, but it's not the, it's one aspect. It's a large one, but um, there's lots of other things going on around the world as well. I guess maybe the question would be, would you paint another aspect? Yeah, I'm going to, I'll, I will be painting more about this, uh, this subject. Um, but, you know, this China's not the only subject that I've ever uh, painted about or made work about. It is the one that, at the moment, I'm most uh, interested and most involved in, yeah. for sure. Um, but, um, I can't answer. I can't answer what the future will be. Uh, I'm afraid. Um, I can only sort of like invite uh, maybe you to speculate on it uh, through 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 these uh, through these works. Um, People are frightened of China because of its momentum. Yes. And it seems unstoppable and completely oblivious to all the political systems outside it. Yeah. I mean, who'd have thought that the the most successful capitalists would be would be communists? They, yeah. they picked it up. Huh? They picked it up since. Yeah, since. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I see this is unfortunately a very sad future. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know whether it's. Uh, it may be sad for the West, uh, <laughs> yes. but I think for China yeah. they're quite happy. You know, and maybe for those that have trade agreements with with China that never had trade agreements with any other nations. 
uh, in all the times that they could have they could have developed uh, mutual trade. So, from perhaps a, a Western point of view that has a long tradition of being the most powerful in the world, the the potential rise or some say the return of China's 5,000 year history of civilization, um, I can see how that might be frightening to uh, those that uh, exist in what has been their privilege of being in a global hegemony. I think the Chinese person might also find this landscape slightly sad. Chinese person might find it yeah. sad. Well, you know, I, uh, part of the work, you know, uh, involves uh, uh, a symbol of the home. Yeah. You know, so I'm always trying to bring it down to a human scale. And what does it mean to exist within any civilization in some ways? You know, when your home can be demolished for to create an idea of a nation home as well. So it's um, all of these are are complicated questions. You know, yeah. morally moral mazes. You know. Um, not only on a human scale, but also through a geopolitical scale as well. So, um, you know, looking at all the multiple moving parts of the different histories, and then what does it mean to exist within one of those, uh, or any of those, um, is, is an ongoing, uh, profound, compelling question that I try to, uh, try to weave together in order to think more about. Well, thanks for answering all our questions. I'm sure they can be ongoing if people want to have yeah. a <laughs> private moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but thank